So, economy and war, Mesopotamia. Oh, I, it, you sure, if you say so. Are you <laughs> waiting for a prom? I have a couple ideas. Okay. Um, when was cheese invented? It was probably first. What, the Comanche, one of their delicacies was the curdled milk from uh, in the stomach of a calf, buffalo. So it was probably found first when they were slaughtering young beasts. That's how they got it, from yeah. the stomach. Yeah, well, and that, I mean, and that was, you got the, I could imagine, like, Homo erectus, you know, catching like a young antelope and being like, oh man, it's still got milk in this its stomach. This is the good stuff. This is the good stuff, you know, because like if you, you don't need a domestic animal to know that in the spring, the baby animals that can't get away are going to maybe have that and it's going to be passed down. It doesn't, I mean, Homo erectus is really early, but some, some pe people on the plains of Africa before there's any domestic animal. Probably ate dog, it. Oh, yeah, because yeah, so you got it once it, a year. They ate it, at least. Yeah. Interesting. And that's where you get the um, um, the enzyme, anyway, the, the, the original way of getting, uh, oh, shit, how could I get this wrong? Um, rennet? Yeah, the rennet. Uh, an, animal rennet is originally, you, you got it from, like, the young male animals that you slaughtered in the spring because you don't want them growing up, and you'd strip it out somehow. Don't ask me how. And What do we want rennet for? You need that for hard cheese. This stuff, anything that melts, it it breaks apart. Uh, the not trypsin. I've been thinking about pancreas <laughs> recently. Oh, yeah, um, you mentioned that earlier. Yeah, <laughs> um, the um, whatever the it's a it's a chemical. It's an enzyme that breaks apart the bond. Casein, C A S E A N, that that lets it coagulate out. Acid can do it, but it produces a different kind of cheese, one hmm. that won't melt on you. That, yeah, that was a follow-up question i was thinking of when i was thinking of cheese yeah like who invented when was cheese invented and then when was the first time it was melted <laughs> oh well probably w came pretty quickly once people were making it on purpose a, but yeah but i mean well yes and no because it was a way of storing food so it's like i have all this milk in the spring Refrigerators are like 7,000 years away. <laughs> How do I store this dairy for the hard times? Mm. And you don't, you're not feeding them grain and stuff. These are just grazed animals being scooted around at, you know, at best. And so you have a big burst of milk in the spring. You need some way to store it over the winter because you don't want to be having to slaughter female animals during the winter because you didn't make enough cheese in the spring. So... That was the original use of it. So you probably had it it's so you probably had the very first cheese people consumed came out of the stomachs of slaughtered baby hunted, slaughtered baby animals. Right. So that Maybe, was kind of incidental at that point. Yeah. A delicacy you got once a year. You probably gave it to the big man. Hmm. Um <laughs> uh and then the next cheese you got was probably from was probably rennet based. May I mean, if you really, they were probably like, well, if if we save the stomach of these young animals that we slaughter that we're hunting, and we have any milk left over, you store the milk in the bag, and you get this ma and something magical happens. And One day later, no refrigeration. It's warm all night, you know. And what do you know? The solids have settled out, and then there's the whey over the top. Well, and, and so, and when is that consumed? Like. I, you save it. That's that's savable stuff. It's, it can be. Yeah, it depends. You can you can save it and dry it out. And like this this goes way modern. I just I just read this one called the Bedouin, um, and it, it was like the seventies. They were they were going after the nineteen seventies. They were going after the last Bedouin tribes in Arabia. You know who was, who was going after? And and an ethno you know ethnologist whatever uh, anthropologist. Oh, okay. And. Um, they were milking sheep and goats and like some somehow making a cheese. It was probably an animal rennet cure and rolling it up and into the little spheres by hand and drying it out on the top of their felt tents hmm. and and then eating it later, you know. Like months months later. Yeah, months later if you can. Because it's, you know. So it's all, a, uh, the, the, I mean. Food I, storage just first. another, yeah, strategy for uh, yeah. overwintering or, mm -hmm. or over droughting or over. Yeah lean times whatever one, yeah one uh, one that they do in northern climates is called bog butter <laughs> you you make butter and you really it's 
It's somehow I forget what it, it's a Celtic thing. It's so this is like Ireland and shit. I mean, when you said bog, that, yeah, that's what. I oh yeah, of. that yeah. I'm that. sure there are bogs elsewhere. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but we all know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, you uh, you make it you make it like more butter. You like really beat the shit out of it, like <laughs> butter the hell. You know, this isn't this isn't fluffy stuff. And then you like wrap it in leaves and you sink it in an acidic bog. So it's a pile of dairy fat. And it's still technically edible 4,000 years later. They still dig it up from time to time. Wow. And it's well, like a big the, lump. In the same way that we occasionally pull a body out of a bog. Yeah, absolutely. Like, there's no oh, oxygen. Is, it's acidic. This is super cool. We, we're, we're learning something. It was their refrigerator. <laughs> and, and these are big. These are big lumps. These, these are like two basketballs. It's a, bi- it's a big fucking thing of butter. Huh. And what, well, why would you do that? Well, raiders are coming by or something. Or you have no other refrigeration, or you don't know what's going on, or you just have way too much milk for one year for some reason. That makes me worry about the folks that put it there. You know, why didn't they come back to it? What that's, happened? That's to how them? you feel about any one of them, any <laughs> cache of silver or gold hastily stuffed. You're like, yeah, you bastard, you poor guy. <laughs> Somebody didn't make it back. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, with the cheese thing, there's two basic types. There's an acid set cheese, which is basically take milk, heat it, and add something acidic enough, and that will cause coagulation but it doesn't cause as much as rennet rennet breaks down uh the proteins the casein proteins that are normally dissolved floating around soluble it breaks them apart enzymatically then they become insoluble and that's the cheese and what's left over is the the acid one is that's the paneer that's paneer that's queso blanco that's the goat well no it's not just the goat cheese i make but a few others and that stuff generally doesn't melt it won't melt under heat. Yeah. But the stuff you make with rennet will. So, well, that's... A, it pulls a, out a, more of the fat. Too. That's good for me. These are the sorts of <laughs> questions I like to ask. Um, like, is that a good demarcation between... If we talk about cheese... Sure. <laughs> which is a silly thing to talk about. Oh, jeez. I mean, is that a good way to say there are two essentially different types of cheese so anything can be put into one or two families the ones made with the acid or the ones made with the rennet yeah you could say that quite honestly you so you know because you could do an acid set or a rennet set with yak or camel or you know any that's the beauty of the dairy industry you you know you can slaughter a male once or an an animal once or you can pull twenty thousand pounds of protein out of it over a 10-year lifespan Hmm. you know so yeah, but then you're stuck with milk. What do you do? What do you do with it? So <laughs> it's a major break. I mean, one reason the Step Nomads did so well is they had a high protein diet. Quite honestly, on what? On 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 milk on and meat ho- and blood. Horse milk and horse meat and horse blood. At or? first, it was just horses, but then see the the horses were domesticated up on the steppe, but the cattle and sheep were domesticated down in the in the Middle East. And so it was when those two met that you really got the synthesis, the the step nomad synthesis. But if you're if you're some farmer in Iraq and you might only eat meat twice a year, you have a very low protein diet and a very harsh lifestyle. Whereas these goddamn step nomads that keep spilling out from the north are eating high protein every day. They eat meat three times a week, if not Almost mostly meat. Wow, living and milk high, and high on the horse and blood. Yes, high on the horse. Yeah, so they they're much they're literally in better health because of that than the than the poor peasants and, and, they keep uh, spilling over. Hmm. Like when that thing is done, you know, n- you know, not universally, but universally within a group of people, you think that actually gives them a, a fighting advantage or a conquering advantage or yeah. something. They just. I mean, I'm not saying they had just t- had a more hardy diet that made Literally. them fiercer or hardier no. warriors. Or no, 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 I don't. Not, not like that. They're not. They're not. I mean, people are emotionally is the same, but um, I mean, so. So how long has cheese been around? Quite a while. Okay, cheese has been around like five, six thousand years. Okay, uh, how long has language been around? Lang- oh, come on, man. I always Language. need reminding. Christ. Right. 50,000 years. Okay. So uh, cheese is as old as recorded civilization is what it sounds like, older. right? Oh, it's older. Yeah, yeah. Cheese is there. Bas- you domesti- once you domesticate goats, sheep, you're, uh, you've got cheese, you know? Because you, you, you have to kill half your herd every spring, just about all the young males. 
So there's your supply of rennet and stomach bags. Right? You only need one one buck goat for every t- for 10 females, if not even that. So once once you have the domestic mammal, the you know, the, the sheep and the goat and then eventually the cow, you've got cheese. Well, you, I, yeah, you're not yeah. you're not sitting around waiting going, "Oh man." I guess that's a better question than like uh, uh, once you have the domestic mammal. So when does that happen? The domesticated man, you know, the the oh, the well. earliest ruminant or ungulate or whatever they are. The very first domesticated plants and animals were not deliberately domesticated. They they co-evolved with people in an environment that was very attuned towards that possibility. And what I mean by that is, and I and I this is This is one of the most, if you can hold nothing else in your mind about the history of wheat and barley, like how to, who sat down and had a think tank and said, you know what we should do? No, the earliest agricultural implements predate domestic wheat and barley. You can sit there and look at a sickle, a wooden sickle with flint stone chipped, you know, napped heads. And you're like, wait a minute, this is 2000 years older than the absolute oldest domestic barley that we have. What's going on? Right. Wild humans are harvesting wild wheat and barley, and it's that implement itself almost that is creating, evolving wild wheat and barley into domestic. Hmm. Similar dogs. Dogs are kind of the exception. Dogs are the oldest domestic that we have, way older than goats or sheep or cattle. Well, you mean domestic animal, or, or do, uh, do they predate domestic wheat? Oh, yeah, they predate it all. They, they okay. were probably wolves that followed around cave, you know, what we call cavemen, you know, mm-hmm. who just, they, were, they co-evolved to be human camp followers probably before anything that we called humans existed no maybe no language you know they, they might be like they're like forty thousand years old were they, were they homo sapiens or were they homo something else's uh, that's i don't know you know but because human the earliest humans were probably not camp followers they were probably cat followers they they were scavenger they were going around scavenging like saber-toothed lion kills and really the, yeah because it earliest hominids are itty bitty little puny you know, oh, I see. Yeah, when you say earliest humans, you mean earliest hom- H- hominids. Hominids. Yeah. I see. Not hominids. not so much hunting as they were. Probably more gathering, scoring, carrying, or yeah, because no, because there's there's these the wrong word. But. There, well, yeah, it is. Ca- it would probably would be carrying. There there's these cut marks on bones <laughs> of really big animals that is like I can't imagine with the stone toolkit that they have that they hunted a mastodon. They probably waited for the cat to get there, and then the hyenas to get there, and then all that, and then they're cracking open bone marrow. Well, that's interesting. I mean, cutting off the, tiny bits. What's the closest sort of analog that is not hominid to the earliest hominid? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, modern day the pre jackal. Oh, okay. I, I was thinking of another primate. Oh, there no, there'd be nothing like that. Because I mean, we were the plains primate. We we left the trees and our hips changed so we could walk upright and all that. Right. So it would, that was when, you know, basically three million years ago, the, the earth got a lot drier. Um, and, uh, the forest shrank and the plains grew and a subset of chimpanzees went to the plains and that's us. And we're sto- the plains chimpanzee. The forest chimpanzees are still there in the forest. Okay. Well, and how do they eat? They eat, well, they eat, the common chimpanzee will eat, will hunt and eat meat, but they do not follow big cats. They're they're catching like baby deer and other baby chimpanzees and things like that. Sure. Yeah. But, so, but, but the, mostly, mostly frugivorous, you know, fruits. And then you're saying the earliest hominid is just following around big cat kills and taking the the, the yeah. remnants yeah. rather than eating fruits and nuts or or hunting fruits and nuts and minor hunting catching baby animals rodents things like that and chomping away but it was probably a tough go of it at first <laughs> like where do you hide i don't you know it, it's a weird jump <laughs> you can't climb a tree necessarily uh, well, right. it's a savanna maybe but you go from like a protected area you can climb the trees at night and nest around and stuff to like the big open plains. Ooh. 
Uh, yeah, it's just funny because when I think of chimps, I think of them as you know strong and you know they're doing things for what they get uh, yeah. to a certain extent. But then your characterization of the uh, the uh, I was uh, saying it relative to the size of the prey, they're sometimes it seems that they're going after, and it's like, well, maybe it was killed by something else. And the Do you think whales are people? Yes, some some of them. Yeah, I sometimes wonder. Persons, non-human persons. Yeah. yeah. They, I'm they're, not they're individuals, you might say. Non-human individuals. Yeah. I sometimes get sometimes worry. But I don't know where the line is drawn anyway. It's not a line you need to worry about. It, as if there was some hard and fast like, well, I get to be an asshole to this right. because it's Exactly. Not, I think that's maybe what I'm cruel. looking for, yeah. Yeah, right. I eat a cat, but <laughs> no, you know, not a whale. A whale's yeah. a person. Yeah, you know? a whale's <laughs> a person. I would I would never torture a person. Uh, right. But boy, exactly. you know, yeah. I, I love putting guinea pigs in the microwave. Mm. <laughs> you know, it, that it, what who cares if they it doesn't matter if there's a hard and fast line. Yeah. Somebody on life support is not a person if they're brain dead. Right. Like you were a person, now you're a body. Right. You still breathe. It sucks to say it, but it's true. <laughs> yeah. So I'd I'd sooner torture a <laughs> yeah a human on life support than a <laughs> you know they should do that than, than a dolphin in in, in the full f- flower of their <laughs> yeah. that's adolescence. What they should, that's it. That's how hospitals should raise money. They like get like rent out brain dead bodies oh to psychopaths, God. right? Like, yeah, cut it up, you know, <laughs> do, <laughs> just do, do whatever you want for like $7,000 an hour. And you'd get all these aristocrats being like, well, I've always wanted to do the yeah. bathroid thing. I mean, generally they find opportunities to satisfy, <laughs> no, no find satisfy their desires one way or the other. Where's Arabia? What? Give like, me some boundaries. Well, I mean, it's. What's cool about Arabia is it always it's like it's always been this very self-contained unit, but it 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 pulls other areas into its orbit after Islam. So if you had said, I, I have a vague idea of North Africa. Oh well, well it's northwest of Africa. Okay, but it's a very it's a surprisingly self-contained northwest. Pen- I mean northeast. Yeah, sorry. Ooh. There Sorry, he is. I've got the I advantage. Yeah. I wonder where the producer was. <laughs> <laughs> the raised eyebrow. I mean, b- before Islam, you never would have, you know, Egypt, like, wh- where is Egypt? Well, Egypt was always self-contained, never a part of Arabia at all, you know, like, and then Islam happened, and now it seems to, uh, Egypt is strangely in the orb. It's, it, Egypt seems more like an Arabian country than a Mediterranean one. Hmm. But it was a it was the beating heart of the Mediterranean, arguably for a long time. You know, it was it was more important. It was the most important part. So Arabia is this very harsh, enormous land that's so contain that it was always so self contained that it that its size was never. It feels smaller than it actually is geographically. Well, you it, know, it, it almost uh, kind of bucked the trend of. Um as the expansion happens, the grasp on your borders lessens. Like, I mean, so I mean, if we're gonna, if you're, if you're gonna try to get into the history of Arabia, for a very long time, it was some, it was sedentary people in oases. It hmm. was Bedouin, and it was, and yet Yemen is kind of this little green corner down in the south east of arabia and then bedouin all over the place uh, along the fringe with this this very harsh desert core when you say bedouin uh, are you talking about an ethnic nomads. group no 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 nomads it's a nomad it's a it's a lifestyle term oh okay yeah. so i always i always thought that was a term for uh, an ethnicity no no no, oh. no 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 hundreds of tribes most of them bedouin ah. living the bedouin lifestyle okay it's like being a trucker you well, know, know, you I know. Be, yeah, yeah 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 um but it was unified pretty much once under Muhammad and the, the early caliphate. Hmm. And it held its periphery. Um, it, it firmly grasped its periphery, which was, anor- I mean, from Spain to India for a very brief moment. But then it was immediately, it, it was like a, Arabia was, I was, I was kind of conflating Arabia with Islam. So Islam keeps spreading and keeps changing and growing. But the way we think of the modern Middle East with Arabia at its core only happened once because of Islam. Hmm. 
And yet, we, and yet these terms still persist, right? People yeah. say Arabian or talk about Arabs. And right. I, I, I mean, that's why I asked is I don't know what people mean. And oh. I, I wouldn't know what I meant if I said Arabian. Well, you know. Arabia is basically an, an ethnic term. Um, Arabia is the geographic region that is very, very big. So who are the Arabians then, if it's an ethnic term? The, the Arabs. Um, they yes, are. Thank you. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. Who are the Arabs? Oh man, the Ara- <laughs> the Arabs. The first reference to the Arabs appear in Assyrian cuneiform tablets from around 800 BC. Hmm. Right, I interrupted you a while ago. We were talking about 1500 BC, but I can't remember where or when. Right. Uh, well, it, that was like being a farmer, like b- being a farmer in Mesopotamia versus, uh, you know, a steppe nomad who's going to come invade, and who gets more protein in their diet. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, more protein in your diet basically transfers into how quickly do your children grow and how healthy are they. Hmm. You know, by the time you're an adult, you don't need a huge amount of protein, but those kiddos sure do. Hmm. So first mentions of Arabs are yeah. via the Sumerians? No, 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 no. no, no. The Assyrians. The Assyrians. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Assyrians were a northern Iraq um, region and ethnic group that stuck around for a really long time, and they were, kind of, they were kind of Rome before Rome in terms of what they accomplished and how militaristic they were, how brutal they were. And how warlike and incredibly efficient and what they accomplished in terms of building an empire, un- unite, basically unifying the known ancient world, that what to them was the known ancient world, but then they collapsed, they, they were defeated in absolutely spectacular fashion. It, it's My a hell home. of a story. Uh, well. And don't say the Macedonians. No, <laughs> no, they were, I mean, I could get into it. But it's, I mean, it's a hell of a, you could do a whole thing just on the history of Assyria. It's so cool. Sure. But uh, they were defeated. They had, a, they had a series of really nasty civil wars. And then the Babylonians, who were south of them, but fairly, they were cousins, you know. The Babylonians and Assyrians were cousins. But the Babylonians were more urbanized, and they invaded north and knocked it over. And In what way were they cousins? Like, eth- culturally, ethnically? Both. I got because I I'm still even linguistically will, will continue to I think. not understand. Like, well, you, uh, you can say Babylon, and I think of a city. But if yeah. you say Babylonians, I don't know what yeah. to think of. Babylonia you know. is a region centered on the city of Babylon, and, and it beca- for how long was it a region well, that you can call Babylonia? Well, okay, so it's it's like. A good, a, a, honestly, a good way to think about it is how, if it's, if it's 600 BC, and you're walking around a place, a peninsula south of the Balkans, you'd say, "Where are we?" And they'd say, "Well, you're in Thebes, or you're in um, Megara, or you're in Athens, or you're in Laconia, or you're, me- you know, well, who are you? Well, we're the Thebans or whatnot. No, who are you?" We're the Greeks. We're the Hellenes. You know, that's it. That's not. We understand that because we we've been trained a lot more in Greek culture. You know, right? The the Hellas that we read the Iliad and the Odyssey. We don't really read Babylonian stuff, but so we understand the idea that there were multiple political entities, city states, all this other stuff. There were multiple regions. You might have multiple independent cities within a single region who fight each other all the time, but they're part of the same region. But they're all linguistically related to each other, and they all mm. consider themselves to be the Greeks. you know. But an Athenian is not a Spartan. you know. A Theban is not a Thessalian. And a, but and they're occa- all Greek. And occasionally their interests are yeah. at odds. Uh, uh, They'll be happy to, to bicker. Oh, not a ca- it's the other way around. Occasionally their interests are aligned. Right. But most of the time they are at each other's throats. You Despite... Know? Cultural continuity. Or oh yeah. Linguistic continuity. Oh, con- oh yeah. I, I don't know if those things are. Who are the Europeans? Not, who are the Europeans? Who do Europeans fight most of the time? The other Europeans. Right. The French hate the Germans. Well, aren't both of them Franks? Didn't they both come from Charlemagne, who was a Frank? 
if it's the year 800, you're going there. Who's a German? Who's a friend? Frank, you know, we don't, there's no distinction. They're cousins. The, the, the Germans and the French are cousins. They're both Germanic tribes descended pretty much from the Franks. That's very simplified. So in that sense, the Assyrians and the Babylonians are cousins. Hmm. The reason they don't get along is because they're cousins and because they're right next to each other. Right. And are what squabbling for resources? Yeah, resources. There's or? no, there was no natural boundary between them. There was no mountain range or big river or anything. It was just this wide open kind of plain between the rivers. And so Assyria and Babylonia, they did not. What do you if you, if you're gonna what? unify Mesopotamia, <laughs> somebody's got to be on top, and it's either gonna be Assyria or Babylonia. Well, in that case, then what what made them different instead of unified? They they are they are slight they. They're next to each other, but they are different regions, you know, and um, and it ended up with different imagined states or imagined political boundaries or. Uh, oh, well, no. Well, they were always trying to find the right boundary between each other. They were in a way that Babylon- but what is it? What is it that makes them each other instead of one? Time, uh, the language was slightly different, you know, Um the eco- their economies were slightly different. And honestly, part of it is just the Assyrians were farther to the north and had n- no natural boundary. So you're talking like the city of Erbil. You're, you're talking like Nineveh province in northern Iraq today. The c- kind of the Kurdish areas, but there are still Assyrians. It's still Assyria, <laughs> strangely enough. And... The Assyrians at that time found themselves under threat from multiple outsiders, where the Babylonians also faced outsiders, but one of their main enemies was the Assyrians. So the Assyrians fa- had found themselves on a trajectory where they kind of were forced to be more warlike. Hmm. And once that dominates, your, you know, once you turn down that path, forever will it dominate your destiny, quite honestly. And so to a certain extent, the Babylonians became more distinct the more Assyria tried to conquer and control Babylonia, the more the Babylonians felt a sense of distinction. Sure. What's the difference between us and a Canadian and Canada? You know, slightly different governmental systems, different histories, same language, right. same right. economy, same set of, same set of almost the, almost identical cultural norms. You know, like nearly, you, yeah. you couldn't tell them apart, but. America is warlike and Canada isn't, you know. So you say there are still Assyrians, are there still Babylonians? Yeah, that's the thing. It's it, it's in, it's an interesting and where is inversion. It, where, where, if if uh, Babylon still existed, where where is that? Iraq. Still still so northern the, Iraq. Yes, middle and southern Iraq. Okay, is, not far. No, no. Uh, basically, what happened is. <laughs> Now I need a list of, you know, in chronological order of the first cities. Oh, God. Or first city states. Yeah. Um, basically, like to specifically answer that, the Assyrians were a powerful political entity up until basically from the end of the Akkadian Empire around 2000 BC, 2300 BC. This is like this is uh, Xerxes and 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 no uh, Xerxes is like a thousand years later. No, but uh, is he an Assyrian? Xerxes, no, he's Persian. Persian, yeah. Who are the Achaemenids? The Achaemenids are the Persians. Oh, okay. Yes, I'm yeah. getting things confused again. Yeah. Um. So, the Assyrians were there for basically two thousand years, roughly two thousand years, a bit less, as a independent. I sometimes sometimes ruled by neighbors, sometimes not. Mm. Off and on for you know h- hundreds after hundreds of years until and then they they got on a track, the Neo Assyrian Empire, and basically between 900 and 600 BC, they conquered everybody around them. They conquer and they what what the the same way that Rome took all the kind of known Mediterranean world like there there wasn't any they kind of found the natural boundaries strangely enough. Hmm. the Assyrians did the same thing these people had been rubbing shoulders trading with each other raiding so an, an Assyrian and a Babylonian walk into a bar and they say god damn I hate these Arameans I hate these Aramean raiders who are they <laughs> they both know who it is they're these people who live in the wild waste down to the southwest you know um, but Assyria conquered and ruled all of those areas they, con- you know, they conquered e- even Egypt at the very end 
they conquered the Levant, the the Israelites, the ten last tribes were taken away by Assyrians, Syria, eastern Turkey today, Armenia, southern Iraq, Elam, and then around 600, a little bit before then, I mean, yeah, so like 630, the Babylonians were really sick of it and moved north under Nabopolassar and allied with Medes and Persians and Cimmerians and Scythians, and they wiped them out, and they de they actually succeeded in de-urbanizing the Assyrians. They knocked down and burned the major cities of the Assyrians, all of them. Just left them. <laughs> left them with... <laughs> made, made it illegal, essentially, for them to <laughs> restart their religious temples and to rebuild their cities, and the Assyrians went back to the countryside eventually converted to Christianity under like the Eastern Roman Empire and Armenia and stuff and are still there. Hmm. The Babylonians were basically assimilated by the Arabs, you know, like it, it, after the expansion of Islam, Mesopotamia basically became Arabized. There was massive migration of Arabs into Mesopotamia. Strange inversion. So at peak Assyrian, <laughs> how many Assyrians were there? Oh, and what year would that have oh, been, or shit. what decade? And are they all of one ethnic group, no, or no. we're calling? Well, and that's the thing. That's like, the another ooh. thing. That, that's another really good way to to tie to. It's a good. You should. The same way Rome was aspirational. We said that one time. You could be, an Arab and be Roman. Right. You could be a Gaul. You you could be, a Berber. Right, you know, yeah, you could be an emperor, and I don't, I don't mean to be fixated on no. ethnicity. It's just no, no, no. These words don't. The, I just wonder, you know, we have words for things. Sometimes we're referring to a nation yeah. state. Sometimes yeah. we're referring no, 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 to an ethnically linked group of people or a linguistically yeah. linked group of people, and I never know what we're talking about. Right. I well, and I, it's important because in the long run, all of these things are fluid because we can all interbreed. So. The e the easy fast distinction like, well, if you're an Arab, you're Muslim. No, right. there are Christian Arabs. Right. There's a million Palestinian Christians. You know, mm -hmm. um, so, or like, well, there's technically there's if there's kind of two lineages of Arabs. There's like the kind of the one we think of the ruling house currently, the House of Saud that's like northern arab but like in yemen and stuff there's people who look different they are shorter they you know they they tend to have darker skin they were more closely tied to ethiopia all inhabitants of arabia all technically arab but you know you get there's always blending right so a series really interesting because it kind of it starts as a region becomes an ethnicity so yeah, in the Become, be in the beginning, it's a geological, it's a, uh, geographic. a geographical reality. Yeah, basically. Yeah. yeah. So I think if I'm, don't quote me on this, but Babylonian, the Assyrian and Babylonian languages. Okay, so before Assyria or Babylonia, there was in the very south of Iraq, there were the first city states of that region. You're talking Uruk, Ur, Eridu, Larsa, Isin, Sin. They were conquered by they they futzed around. <laughs> they had fun fighting each other for about a thousand years. This is about this starting about three thousand BC. So three three to two. Three to two. And they just, they just, they fight each other. In. Yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> it's so it's more like it's more like three to twenty two hundred. You know so so okay. they they only eight hundred years of partying around, <laughs> fairly isolated. But you must not. Did they live well? I'd say so. They had fun. Yeah yeah. They ate a lot of barley, drank a lot of beer. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. built a lot of things out of mud. Pretty sweet. Uh, uh, so they, wait, let me, and then they were conquered by a, nor a group of, a guy, might have heard of him, called Sargon of Akkad, and Akkad is a region. And, mm. and presumably, he recruited from that area. So Akkadian became the language of administration instead of Sumerian. That's interesting. Okay, so Akkadian, the language now spreads even after the Akkadian Empire disintegrates. Babylonian and Assyrian languages are both cousins that split out of Akkadian. There's, you know, it's the same exact way that, you know... Well, when the, when the, when the Normans 
<laughs> hit yeah. England, then yes. then French was the language evolves forward. Yeah. 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 French was the lingua franca. Ooh. Ooh. So Assyrians started as a region that was conquered by Akkadians in northern Iraq. Probably a, it was a frontier zone. Assyria is interesting. So it, so it starts as a region, becomes an ethnicity, <laughs> becomes the core of an empire that shrinks and swells with the times, and then becomes, when it really sets out on the empire path, it becomes aspirational. It becomes... Oof. If you believe in that Ashur, was the last mistake you ever made. Well, is to be aspirational. And empires assimilate, so it's not about you know, like it's not about no. We want to hold on to the core of who we are. Like let's say the Jews, you know, they they were around around the same time as the Assyrians in the year, you know, seven hundred B.C. Roughly, there's Assyrians fighting the Israelites, you know, mm. so. But the Jews don't try to assimilate. So there's a big difference between having a self-identity that's much more close-knit and not assimilatory versus one that says, no, no, we will make you like us. Right. So if you were conquered by the Assyrians, and let's say you were deported to their home territory because you fucked up big time, you kept rebelling against the Assyrians, no matter how many of your people they flayed and you hung get, from you trees. You get shipped? Yes. Or carted? You walked, and you were given a right of safe passage, and you were allowed to take your stuff with you, and you maybe went to the outskirts of Erbil or something, or northern Iran or somewhere, and it was like, if you make your sacred vows to the king, and if you attend the ceremonies for Ashur, and you fight for the army and all this, and and you believe, then you are Assyrian. So they, they were assimilatory, and then when they were defeated... They went back to being a region and a people and an ethnicity again. And hmm. they're still there. You can look, you can Google them. Look up beautiful Assyrian women. They're, they're there. Oh, wow. <laughs> and they look, and they uh, look. Actually, I've got to, I've got to go. I've yeah. Gotta, they look, they <laughs> got could, some Googling they to could do. belong on a temple of, you know, Endur Shah Rukh Ken. They've got long black curly hair. They look like it. It's so fucking cool. Oish. Big almond dark eyes i mean i'm, I'm not trying to be <laughs> racist but damn you know it's an amazing story and that, well, and they're I'm mostly distracted. christian you know they're still mostly christian i think they're eastern syriac or something hmm. yeah i don't think they're part of the armenian orthodox whatever it is right I, but i could be wrong so yeah it kind of depends on the path you're on when assyria started and they were not assimilatory and they were more about keeping the outsiders out and the insiders in the I think the the, Ass the Assyrian king's original title was something like keeper of the temple of Ashur or something. It was or like re not regent, um, steward or st yeah, like steward of Ashur or something like that. Ashur is the god mm -hmm. of the city, you know. Um, but what they had of their religion was it wasn't monotheist, but Ashur was supreme, and so it okay. seems at all analogous to sort of. But well, I'm sure it changed in. In Egypt, uh, but uh, was there any any of that? Like, well, it's we've got a we've got a pantheon, but you know, no, it's always kind of raw or no. Be Egypt, e Egyptian, the Egyptian pantheon changed so much over time. Like Egypt, the last part is Ptah, Ptah, Hecapatah, place of Ptah, who huh. is I think the god of wisdom. I think he had a crocodile head, so hmm. that. And that was the name for like Memphis, I think, which just was place of Ptah. And that, and you are talking like, that's three thousand BC. Well, by the time you get, and then Ra is descendant, and then when the Thebans came came over, when when the Theb the Theban dynasty, the people, <laughs> the Egyptian nobility who were centered in the south of Egypt, of, in near Thebes, were big into another god called Amun, and so almost as you've got 3,000 years of Egyptian continuity, so the religion changes so much over time. Hmm. Unlike the Assyrians, it seems the Assyrians really stuck with Ashur from beginning to end. Despite having a wealth of other, other gods to deal yeah. with, yeah. But there was all, always... It was always Ashur, it's Interesting. Seemed. And it seems to me that, like, you want to talk about, like, religious fundamentalism or, like, re it's... This is, this is only my impression of an empire that came and went 2,600 years ago. But when you listen to their rhetoric and how they behaved and how hard they were, like they 
fought. You did not compromise. And if other people who you <laughs> too, had... Too hard to persist. Yes. Yeah. And so the smooth-eyed religious, like, it filled them with white light. Like, they meant it. And so it seems... There seems to be that element, whereas, like, other ancient peoples are kind of like, meh, we'll get along. Right. It'll be fine. Yeah. So they weren't monotheistic, but Asher was... He was a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> no, no human sacrifices or anything like that. You gotta, you have to. He was part of the, so the pantheon. Pantheon there might be people that weren't Assyrians that knew of Asher or even. Well, shit! You didn't just know of Asher. He was sending armies and burning down your city. Oh, I guess so you would it, know then. Yeah, you would have some notion, and you swore in the name of Asher and all this other stuff to obey the king in every single thing he told you to do. And if you were late on tribute or short one bit, you know, Asher would be mad. Asher would be mad. So they conquered in the name of Asher, and but but I guess what I mean is like he was like he was like other Mesopotamian deities, you know, like you you if you would. I, I assume that if you were there for a ceremony with Osher, where the king was doing whatever he had to do, I don't even know. And it, it's not, you, you is must... Is this an instance where, uh, you know, the highest political figure is also the oh, yeah. highest religious figure? Oh, yeah. The, yeah. the king was originally the high priest. Right. I mean, that's the case with Egypt, too. Like, he right. started out as the highest priest. I mean, I, n- I know him. of the term, I know of the term theocracy, right. but, like, is that... Ooh. Equally applied to Egypt as it might be to the Assyrians, like yeah. is the king a god king? He's Maybe. not a god. He's not a god, but he is the god's regent. You know, right? We yeah. you don't have to go that far, quite honestly. Like it, the earliest, yeah. I mean, it, the Westerners are still doing that, yeah, in a way. Yeah. I mean, like absolutely, the Pope isn't a god, but he is your yeah closest. Um, the divine, access, the divine you know. right of kings did not end very long ago. You know. Where it's just like, oh yeah, that's that's God's guy. But I get, but and the is, and the but and the, like maybe an important distinction, right? That the, the difference between you know this figure being a, a a vessel or a mitigator and this figure being divine himself. Oh yeah, and and is, or, or, even or maybe it's not important. I don't oh, know. it is. I think it is. Uh, the grandson of Sargon, uh, Naram Sin, um, he he apparently claimed to be, and so he's Akkadian. His fa- his grandfather was the big guy Sargon. He apparently claimed to be a god himself, and he represented himself as a god in his stele, in his like the physical representation. We have the, at least one. It's the only one I know of. But he has like the stars of godhood above his head and big horns, and, and apparently that even back, we say this even back then. So I'm <laughs> right. I'm doing it. <laughs> right, but right. we must not say even back then. Even those poor simpletons back then. It left a par- a really bad taste in everybody's right. mouth. Even the Acadians. Even, even those people thought it was blasphemy. <laughs> exactly. Or, 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 yeah, or yeah. A little too far. Even those yeah. morons. Look at these yeah. dipshits. You know. <laughs> Look at <laughs> yeah. But uh um I almost did it. <laughs> but uh um so no, he, it, the, he was not a god himself, and very, and I don't, I don't, I can't think of any others besides Zimri Lim who actually claim to be gods themselves, divine in their person. Are there? Uh, they, it's it's a it's a distinction that ancient peoples were very clear to make. No, he okay, he's God's so regent, and the clergy, the clergy and the king rule together. The religious establishment and the sec, quote secular establishment rule together. Checks right. and balances. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, so what, what the executive what? and the legislative, right? In a sense, I would say almost more. It's all like the military and the financial system, in a way. You know, you don't you don't want clergy leading the army, and you don't want the king in charge of the financial system directly for everybody else. Like a disti- uh, something I always try to say when talking about ancient peoples is y- the hardest thing. I think the single hardest thing for us moderns to understand about ancient peoples, and I really mean this, is the temples and the churches were the financial system. If you wanted money, you had to go to the church. That was where people deposited their money. They gave gifts to it. 
of course, with distinctions of individuals and whatnot. But a really good example is there was a Byzantine Empire emperor who was in tough shape with the Persians. This is Eastern Roman Empire around 600s, early 600s. So this is before Islam. When he was in a really bad way, he went to the Orthodox Church, the Patriarch, and said, we need to do this. And they went into the churches. They went into the Hagia Sophia, and they pulled down the metal statues and the gold plate and candelabras and whatnot, and they melted it down into coins to pay the soldiers. Damn. And then he... The, w which patriarch was it? The patriarch oh, of... Constantinople. Constantinople. Oh, yeah, yeah. This, know, this is the emperor, yeah. Heraclius. The, I forget the patriarch's name. And they are parade, and the, the city is under siege, and he takes that army that he paid with the church's <laughs> money. <laughs> while the city... He, he leaves con his capital city under siege takes a fleet across the Black Sea, invades down through the north into the heart of Persia and starts sacking their cities and makes them have to retreat. That's wonderfully and then dramatic. He, it is one of the more incredible stories. And, and you don't, you wouldn't and believe and this finally guy. Finally, that fucking gold and silver got what, used for something. But yeah. that's the point. That's <laughs> yeah. the point. Yeah, you, you like, never think of yeah, the other, like the golden stuff in the church as, as a savings account. For, where, where's like, the, oh, just where's a, the only to worship? It's the only safe place. It's the bank. There are no secular banks, really. They, you know, there's, there's shades of gray, but the safe, it's sanctuary, right? But is that, is that performing a practical function that way, or is it just yeah, another I, macro organism that sits there and accumulates excess energy? I mean... And I, this is all s stolen and misunderstood language from you, basically. But, right, uh, but, I mean, it, that's, what it, it, that's why, I mean, it's really hard for us to understand. Like, what would happen to your retirement, if you have one, if you pulled it out of that magical spiritual realm yeah, I didn't, <laughs> known I didn't as the market, <laughs> known <laughs> as the stock market, where it's always going to get better and <laughs> salvation awaits. <laughs> what if you lost faith and pulled your money out to show your lack of faith? Well, I don't know. I mean... That's like uh, I'm pulling it out to 1929, really isn't it? Practical. Like isn't that what happened? If like enough no, people, people lost faith, their money right. out, they lost yeah. faith. Yeah. If enough people lose faith, suddenly the wealth isn't there. Hmm. So this is all built on a, like a, a, a series of premises that only are as strong as people believe them. Yeah, religions are human creations, but look what they can make people do. And they're just, you know, good music. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. And so it's really hard. We're like, oh, well, we're not religious. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, the secularization. I'm like, look at the hagiography, you know, like, oh, man, this new technology is really going to transform your life. Fuck that. You're a person. You have a day-to-day -day thing. It's not going to transform your life. Everybody's going to walk around with a computer. They're going to look at every fucking moment of their life. Okay. And how's heaven? treating you you know <laughs> like <laughs> right yeah we all love it oh it's great it's grand and it's just so transformative and everybody's you know? so happy yeah i and more well adjusted than ever oh yeah uh, self-actualized yeah not neurotic at all mm. yeah okay so heraclius all right so heraclius the what oh man the first i don't even know <laughs> i don't know his number <laughs> uh, I was just making a joke. Oh, it, <laughs> sometimes it might I be make good guesses. I mean, they should call him the great because of what he did, but it's an incredible story. He, the rough outline is there's a new Persian empire in town, <laughs> not the Achaemenids, <laughs> not the Achaemenids, <laughs> but this is after. So the rough history of Persia is Cyrus the Great establishes the Achaemenid Empire. There's a Darius in there somewhere. Yeah, he's in there. And he... Uh, establishes the biggest empire ever seen, much bigger than Assyria. Egypt, so he, I mean, like, they they ruled Macedonia for a while, and Egypt, all the way to the Indus River, you know. They get conquered by Alexander the Great, tough luck there, you know. And um, then they kind of <laughs> languish hurts. under some Greek ah. dynasties for a while, and then those Greek Macedonian dynasties get wiped out by a n different group, non-Persian group, um, called the Parthians that come down and wipe out the Greeks. And in doing so, they also, they, they don't wipe out the Greeks. They replace them as a ruling class. But in doing so, they also get as the door prize, the Persians, the ancient Persians, people who still think of themselves as the Persians, the Persians of Cyrus the Great, right? Hmm. They rule them for like 400 years. 
these Parthians. And where are the Parthians from? Central Asia, from the north. What makes them Parthians? What sort of word is this? Oh, it's a region. It's it's okay. named after a region called Parni, Parnii. Okay. Yeah. And they are they speak a cousin language of Persian, actually. They speak an Iranian language. Iranian itself, the word comes from Aryan. Mm, right. You know? And so they rule the Persians as a ruling class and this, you know, assimilate. They, they, are more, they are assimilated more by the Persians than the Persians are assimilated by them. Persians are a strong, ancient, proud, disciplined, distinguished uh, people. And um, so okay. they, they're it's the Parthians. Like the, it's like the, um, the uh, barbarians uh, in coming around uh, outside yeah. of early China that just yes. end up being Chinese. Yes. You no, know? that's a really good way to like, think about yeah, it. Like, yeah. Yeah well, yeah, we'll do that. The, you had to. Like, the, the, the Persians at this point are not steppe nomads at all. They're city dwellers, but they have a you know, strong military ethos. And The Parthians, though, are the ones who the Romans fight against for a long time. And then after Rome splits in two and the West de- uh, disintegrates, <laughs> the Persians kind of roughly around the same time throw off the Parthians who at this point have been there 400 years. There it's not like they're newcomers like whoa. There's the four centuries of the four. Parthians being the ruling class. The ruling class but not oppressive. So you what can't, does that mean? That means It means they control the, the highest government. And the, the, ru- politicians the ruling family and is Parthian. And the and the merchants. No, probably not the merchants. They're more like it's kind of like a military ruling upper uh, class officers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, who are still probably recruiting from people living in the area they used to 300 years ago step nomads it's so fucking long you know it's hard for me to think about it it's i find it incredible that the persians even they probably practice the parthians as far as we know didn't run away they didn't go back home they themselves were simply overthrown the persians said no it's not going to be a Parthian ruling class anymore now it's a persian ruling class 400 years later 400 years they held on to that shit that's incredible. Like that's like the English kicking out the Normans again. It do, it doesn't it barely makes sense, you know. <laughs> the Spanish are gonna. You'd kick. think you'd get used to it after year, you know, three twenty. Yeah, and, probably, and that would just be <laughs> sort of. A, yeah. Every day. <laughs> that's what. I, don't fuck with the Persians, man. <laughs> they the have one. their own calendar, which yeah. I think is usually a, a symbol of uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, long, <laughs> longevity and power in the culture. <laughs> So this is around the year, so Parthians are 200 B.C. to about 200 A.D., roughly. And then, the, the, so now the Persians are back. And this, we call this empire the Sasanian Empire. And they have rulers called, like, Khosro, Khusro. Well, who does that sound like? Cyrus. Like, they are taking the names of the ancient Achaemenids. And they are literally negotiating with the Eastern Roman Emperor in Constantinople saying, we will be at peace with you if you give us back all of the old ancient Persian territory, (laughs) which is like three quarters of the Eastern Roman Empire, (laughs) right? 500 years later. 500 fucking years later. From before Alexander the Great. They're saying, you know that land that we controlled before Alexander the Great? We want that back. They, they probably didn't mean it. They were saying this when they were winning. <laughs> so part it's of them th- talking tough. It's them talking tough. They, some of them, some of the officers under the king were probably like, I'm just, each other like I'm just yeah. impressed they remember. Well, I mean. I, that's what I mean. The Western world has dark ages. They don't. They remember. And we're, we're, I mean. I'm preoccupied with like <laughs> assholes that want to fly the the rebel flag, and that was like yeah, you know, yeah, just a couple of years ago. Yeah, that wasn't it very long. Seems ago. Seems like a sort of an important conflict. Yeah, like uh, no, I, that 500 years ago, that time you took that. Yeah, you know, I mean, we'll be cool if you give that yeah. back to us. Yeah, yeah. But when you're talking about these people, you know, oh, I want back what you took 500 years ago. What it really means in terms of control is revenue streams. Yes. I want those to point back to yes. my yes, capital yes. instead of you. Yeah. So it's like you're just trans. It's like yeah. a wealth transfer, basically. Yes, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, it wasn't the principle of the thing. It was the revenues. Well, isn't that so always the case with... That's like, what empires I'm, are. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say, I mean, that's still a word I want to ask about. Like, right. what is right. an empire? You right. used the we, word empire. We got to get to her. Right. We, we can finish Heraclius. We're, so, we're getting real close. <laughs> so they, they 
they invaded under I think it was Khosrow, Khosrow the Great. They fight off and on against the Eastern yeah, Roman the Empire. The fact checkers are going to be lot. really mad. Yeah. So the Eastern Roman Empire is ready to be gone. There are some steppe nomads to the west centered in the current country of Hungary. There's a big plain there, the mm. Carpathian Basin, the Pannonian <laughs> Plain. That's why I brought this book. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. The, the Avars who are besieging Constantinople from the land, and the Persians have sacked Antioch. They have taken Egypt. Uh, not Antioch. Yeah, and which we, at that point, it was a big city. It was, it was, the, east, it was the western end of the um, Silk Road. And, and they have all of Turkey, and they are trying to be there. Like, they, I think they've Chalcedon, the, the city on the other side of Constantinople. So, like, the empire is basically the Balkans, sort of, but the Avars are there and not much else. And, like, some Mediterranean islands, he does the thing, melting down the stuff, sends that army down, comes down through um, Armenia. Armenia is Christian, picks up some allies. They defeat. The Persians have to pull back to defend their homeland. He defeats them, Heraclius does, at the Battle of Nineveh, right mm. on the outskirts of the old Assyrian, which at this point is like a lumpy field, and defeats them badly. And I think he sacks Ctesiphon and like Ecbatana. And the Persians are like, we need to sue for peace, because damn. <laughs> <laughs> so Heraclius has developed, I think by this point, aquaphobia where he can't stand the sound of running water, and he's terrified of being on a boat, so much so that when they get him on a boat, they have to disguise it so it looks like land. Uh, have, was he ra had rabies or something? To, I, no. That's they so have to strange. terraform his boat. They had to terraform his boat. Yes. Gra grass yeah. and weeds. and <laughs> Yes, because he's like super paranoid and all this shit. So awesome. So while this has been going on, Muhammad is preaching in Mecca and Medina and unifying Arabia. And so the Eastern Roman Empire, Empire and the Sasanians are completely exhausted. They've fought themselves to just the bitterest standstill. And basically they return to like a status, okay, we'll destroy each other's economies and cities and countryside completely to return to the status quo. And then not a few years later, one reason the armies of Islam were so effective was they were hired by mer as mercenaries by both sides. Hmm. You know, out, so comes out of the desert where no army has never really ventured from before. Comes the unified armies of Islam. Hmm. They completely conquer the Sasanian Empire, and they ought, you know they take Egypt and the Levant and Syria, which are very important grain growing regions. Like Herac Heraclius gets back to Constantinople barely. They had to drag him there, kicking and screaming on a boat, and then he's confronted. <laughs> they had to, <laughs> to knock him out and put him under board. Yeah, basically. Yeah. And it's, so it's an incredible. Put him in the story. cargo hold. And I, th if I recall, it might not be him. I think it was him though. Shit, I, I, I don't want to besmirch his memory, but he. Yeah, it's heaven forbid, right, Her Heraclius. Oh, <laughs> he he can see. He's like I'm insane. And I am abdicating because you need a strong leader at this time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I think I think that was well, him. It's not besmirching at all. No, that's it's like, not. That's yeah. the most integrity I've heard of in a yeah. long time. Really. Yeah. So Reagan hats didn't do off. it. It's an, just an incredible joke. story. I don't know anything about Reagan. But the reason why they did this was because in those days, economy was entirely agricultural. And so empire was all the only revenues you had were from the land. You know, it was sunlight hitting plants was the energy source of your society. Why do you why do armies have to go out and to control physical territory? It's economic. It's an economic region. Now, modern days, the economy has escaped national boundaries. And geographic restrictions. And so that's why war, we're seeing this incredible change in warfare very quickly, you know. And it's not, it's not just because of nuclear weapons. It's because the economy has escaped geographic restrictions. Railroads, overseas shipping. I mean, when you say, oh, back then the economy was sunlight hitting plants. It sounds very practical and direct. And now you say it's something else. Energy. It's energy harvest. H how do you harvest energy? The history of the Mediterranean, you know, you're, you, Josh mentioned the, the arrow of resources going to the capital city of Persia, mm -hmm. where they can be collected and then redistributed to its power structure, or pointing to Constantinople, where it was c held together, where it was pooled together, and then distributed to that power structure. You know, it's like two slime molds competing over the same food source. 
Well, sure. The history of the Mediterranean can be understood as what direction the grain of wheat, I mean the wheat of Egypt, flowed. Egypt was the world's biggest supercharged grain-growing region by far. And so... If that's the case for that time and place, then now, now what? Now what is the... Like, what's the arrow to look at to right. understand exactly yeah energy it, fos- wh- what direction fossil fuels go right yep well mm-hmm. which direction do they go well the united states has four percent of the world's population roughly but it uses 20 percent of its oil and if you know that you know what american foreign and domestic and economic environmental well, policy you, has you to be you say that pretty cavalierly but we're not <laughs> all as quite as clever as you and i'm like <laughs> i can even just like take take your 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 postulate and say oh okay i uh, i'll just take it on faith but that doesn't mean that i have that then i know exactly what our well, okay. policy would be I, yeah you know but right i'm just saying like if that's the it's you know it's like holding if, if it's like one of the like a magic eye thing or like well if you put like a green screen in front of this Certain shapes pop out and certain, you know, other colors disappear. And then there's a new image to see. That's what I mean. So we we could go into that, but that sounds like another episode, so to speak. But yeah, like, so take Egypt, you know, it's that incredible valley that is like, you couldn't physically imagine a better way to grow grain. Like, number one, it's in the desert. So it's always the right temperature, roughly. And there's no cloud cover. There's no rain to wash away your crops in the spring there's no bad spring where it's too cold too long and so the grain doesn't grow oh and the flooding is incredibly predictable like it had it that's how they had they discovered the 365 day year first oh it was them yeah, yeah. and and because it like every like oh just, they, just make they, a mark on a took stick good data for a little while and they took good it data out. for millennia on end like you put a stick next to the nile and you mark the spot how high it gets. And then on a different stick, you mark the number of days until the water reaches that exact same level. And it's 365. <laughs> it was like that. Nice. It's a good trick. It's a good trick. It's amazing. That's, that's how, they calculated, their, that's that, how yeah. they calculated their taxes. They had a temple on a rock in the middle of the Nile. And there were steps going down called a Nileometer. And if it hit step A... You had to pay more in taxes, fucker, because <laughs> the water went higher. So you have to grow more grain because you get so good. that's literally how they did it. And so, oh, and it drops all this silt and, you know, and so it like kills a lot of weeds. That's cool. So, you, so oh, they like they were worried about weeds. Well, they, you know, they would have to weed their crops. But and then for a third of the year when it's all under flood, you have nothing to do except look at your flooded field. And so you go and the pharaoh puts you to work making a pyramid, you know, did pu- push this rock. So. It's like it's like a science fiction experiment of like, ah, let's, uh, come on, that would never happen. You know, that's being silly. You're saying in the middle of the desert, there's this lush valley that not <laughs> only is lush, but it floods itself. The water, they don't have to pump the water up. You don't have to be good engineer. You don't even have to be good engineer. Like, yeah. like oh, I built a dike I and it holds yeah. a pond. I grew some fish in it and then I low, I let <laughs> the water run out to an, a dry area. You can be proto-statisticians instead yeah. of engineers. <laughs> yeah, you can believe that the sky is some goddess over you and you still know exactly how many and days there are in a year. Yeah, yeah, it works. Yeah, it works. Okay, and you so, can still use it to predict future yeah events so so for the first so for you know it's first unified in 3000 bc roughly under narmer and then for a thousand years the longest period of peace and prosperity with no foreign invasion and no civil wars no in no f- full-blown societal civil wars except for like fights among royal families you know like a lot of qualifiers here right sounds like a no, baseball stat no okay <laughs> 900 years no foreign invasions no collapses or any 900 years relative peace and prosperity then it falls apart then it pulls back together then it falls apart again then you have the glorious new kingdom you know king tut was like the end of that time you know he was he was the pathetic whimper at the end of the new kingdom so after that you can tell who's in charge of the mediterranean by what direction or even the middle east by what direction the excess grain from egypt is going where is it going because before then, it was all self-contained, and they used the wealth to build pyramids and the most incredible arche- archaeology. But after that, they were bled white, you know. So Assyria captures and conquers them, and the excess grain is now going to Nineveh. And then after that, it's, you know, the Persians 
the, the excess grain is is feeding the Persian power structure. And then after that, it's feeding, well, technically like Alexander, you, you know, for a little bit Alexander. But then the Ptolemies were a Greek ruling class that bled Egypt white. They were the ones who were really guilty for destroying ancient Egyptian culture. You know, they bled it white. They enriched themselves, this tiny minority, the Ptolemies, at the expense of the Egyptian peasantry and priests and all that. And then after that, it goes to Rome. And, the, you know, because Rome conquers when, it. And when was the Ptolemaic sort of... Bas- basically from the death of Alexander to Cleopatra, 300 B.C. to 30 B.C., hmm. roughly. And be- even before then, you know, when Rome was on the rise and Egypt was still technically free, a really important part... They- Rome was as tied to the grain of Egypt as we are to the oil of Middle East. Like, they, they could... Italy could not feed itself in the late Republic. But hmm. So they're like, hmm. <laughs> they... The Egyptians were very, very uh, careful not to offend the Romans, and the, you know, the Romans took it anyway. So then it goes to Rome, and then Rome disintegrates, and then it goes to Constantinople, and then, you know, so just no, just watch that arrow spin around like on a board game you spin. What direction is it going? Yeah, I would definitely like to watch that arrow. Yeah. All those ancient capital cities you hear about, the really big ones, usually couldn't feed themselves. It's a pre-industrial economy. You cannot ship enormous amounts of food over land. You just can't do it. Well, how do you? Uh, you can't put it in ox <laughs> carts, so it has how to be by sea. Have you found a city without being able to support your city? I I don't know. Seems like back then it was a new idea. So how would you have ever been able to oh, do man. it without? There, there's a talk we need to I listen guess to. Is it's that empire then? Is that what that's empire means? Is that you? That's you a good take symptom. From outside, yes. To maintain your unsustainable. Yeah. It can be, yeah, and it's a really good symptom. It's a very good symptom. Those kind of places, though, they're going to be at some kind of transportation nexus, though, right? Pastry. They're going to be a port yeah. or a, a, something like that or a spot on a river, for yeah. example. Yeah. Is, is, does Nineveh conform to that? Is Nineveh Isn't Nineveh on, on, a, on the ocean? No, no. Nineveh is oh. in Assyria. Near, Nineveh is like in Kurdistan today. Oh, mm. I was, where was Jonah? going when he had ate by the whale i thought he was he right. did he did oh, yeah, jonah right. went he to nineveh yeah, yeah 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 i just he assumed saw, it was on no. the on the coast he, because of that no yeah, no, no yeah, he, he stopped outside and then he was sh- he was sleeping under a <laughs> bush yeah sleeping under a bush and then god frags uh, the bush frags it with a worm <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> and then he's pissed about <laughs> a his worm, bush. a worm ate a worm ate its roots and <laughs> it, it <laughs> wilted or something about it. yeah, it's, it's so yeah, cool yeah. that's the best part yeah, everyone knows that Jonah got ate by a whale, but like the best part is just that he's outside Nineveh. Yeah. Nineveh is like hundreds of miles inland and Oh uh, whoops. Yeah, yeah. It's northern Iraq, yeah. So Jonah must have really stomped his way to the Mediterranean shore. He had to beat some feet. Fuck you <laughs> for four hundred miles. <laughs> and then fuck you some f- fuck you some more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man. Because I got a little sun on me. Yeah. But apparently and they all repented. These fuckers are, yeah, what, they, 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 what were they? Nineveh wearing? repented, I guess. or something? Yeah, yeah. <sighs> what a weird what story. The Assyrians would never have done. <laughs> 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 yeah, but, Nin- I mean, Nineveh was, the, for a while, under the Neo-Assyrians, Nineveh was the most populous city in the world, I think. It was like a million people. It was in a very productive area, but I'm sure a lot of grain was being shipped up from, like, Babylonia, you know? Like, they, they, can, they could grow a lot of grain in those days in... Mesopotamia, <laughs> not as much good, as Egypt. Not back in the good days, yeah, yeah. I grow a lot of grain. Yeah, Mesopotamia. no, it's. I mean, you can follow it. Like the empire, empire is like it can be deliberate, but unfortunately, sometimes it seems to be an epiphenomenon where it, it can be deliberate because so other people have done it before. And one guy is literally like, in the manner of my ancestors, uh, right. I am going to do... I have a model. Yes, you have a model to be built on. I, I, I will choose, and also I have a little bit of power to be able to choose and yeah. model. Yeah, and sometimes it's quite literally like, you're not just doing that. You, you don't, you're not imitating the model in your own head. You're saying, hey, everyone, m- maybe you're the leader of a minor family who finds himself into some lucky military luck, and you keep running with it. And then maybe 15 years later, you're like, hey, everyone, remember that guy Sargon? You know, him? We're going to do that again. Mm. And hence, you have an Assyrian king named Sargon II. He chose that name. That's not our name for him. He said, you know, it's I'm nice doing this. A, nice a thousand. A fan. Yeah. yeah. What? 1,400 years later? Dang. Yeah. 
He f- and he founded a city, Dur Sharuken, named after himself. I wonder if it was a deep cut at the time or like a very popular like No, I'm um I'm um uh, I'm I'm Abraham Lincoln. The well the second known, or the well known one is Caesar too, right? SARS and Kaiser. Yep. And so well, on yeah, are yeah. all mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. A family name. The, the, what's a, a, a side bit of the Sar, Sargon itself? Sharukan. Oh, Sharukan. Those aren't related, are they? No, he's not remote. What do you mean? No, I mean. Oh, etymo- oh no, 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 which is an interesting story languages. in itself, but yeah, how yeah. how Caesar became just a family name, hmm. the the Summerfield. Are you the Summerfield of Germany? Are you the Summerfield? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a good, <laughs> interesting. You should ask. I but am. No. Sh- Sharukhan means, or in Akkadian or Sumerian, it means the king is legitimate. Literally, he made that his title. The king is legitimate, probably that's because cool. he wasn't. Me thinks thou dost. <laughs> yeah, exact. No, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> And you better not bring it up. Yeah. It's always a bad look to... You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not a good look. No. And yeah, but he called himself... I don't... I mean, I, whatever the name second was, we say Sargon the second, but that was the equivalent Assyrian name for him. Josh, can you hold this down? I gotta... We're at an hour and 20 minutes, so we could probably just say that's enough for now. Pretty good. Next time, economy and empire. (laughs) (laughs) Stay tuned. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, (laughs) we're just gonna re rehash a lot. Yeah. I don't know. We could we could make these twenty minuteers, and we might it might make more sense. Sure. I I don't want it to just be like read an essay. You know, like here's exactly what we mean. Uh, It. I think it's more interesting, or I don't know about. It's like more fun if it's meandering and like, yeah. oh yeah, and then that thing from earlier is actually yeah. right. Yeah, I feel like there was a good spot like twenty minutes ago, but instead, 